All right, so let's get started. Uh, my name is Sunila Freire, and I'm from Hydrocision. And we are very honored to be supporting AMSSM um, this evening by sponsoring this webinar. And um, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, our faculty today um, for the webinar is, includes Dr. Chris Maracalo of Ben Highlands Healthcare in Pennsylvania, Dr. Dominic King of the Cleveland Clinic, Dr. Nate Holmes of Reconstructive Orthopedics in New Jersey. Unfortunately, Dr. Jenning could not join us today since he has to cover the Cleveland Guardians game this evening um, uh, after the lockdown. Um, so um, each, the, each of our faculty represents different settings in which they practice. Um, Dr. Varacalo practices at an academic institution in a large healthcare system serving rural Pennsylvania. Dr. King is at a large academic institution. And Dr. Nate Holmes is in a private practice that serves individuals like us, as well as high level athletes. Each of them has been interested in the concept of minimally invasive tenotomy um, since they graduated from their fellowship programs and have been doing the procedure since. Um, over the years, they've refined their clinical approach um, with respect to evaluating and making treatment choices for their tenopathy patients as well as the practical aspects of performing the procedure. Um, one of the common questions we get from um, new users is about post-procedure rehabilitation. Our faculty will share their guidelines to help patients regain their lifestyle, whether it's being pain-free during everyday activities, getting back to work, uh, recreational activities, whether it be walking, running, golfing, tennis, or helping a high-level athlete get back to their pre-injury level of performance. Um, and so with that, um, thank you again for joining us. Uh, please type your questions in the chat box um, as you listen to the presentation. And, um, and now I'll hand it off to Dr. Chris Varacalo. Thank you, Sunila. Um, you can advance the slides here. <clears throat> so what I would like to start and speak with you all about, and, and thanks for coming, and, and like Sunila said, thank you for your introduction. My name is Chris Farrakello. I do sports medicine in, in rural central Pennsylvania, and my practice has really evolved into one that um, treats patients um, with minimally or microinvasive procedures. Um, that have a uh, minimized downtime and have a high uh, success rate and a fast return to recovery. And so I'd like to talk to you about patient selection um, in terms of minimally invasive tenotomy. And I want to really frame this in your mind because we all see these patients, but I really want to kind of expand your mind, expand your uh, thought process in terms of you know, what patients would be ideal for a minimally invasive tenotomy procedure. So to start with that, we have to really make sure we're all on the same page here. So a tenotomy is a surgical act that involves division and or debridement of a tendon. And generally, and from a, a global view, the patients and diagnoses to consider with, for minimally invasive tenotomy would be those that have chronic tendon pain. And typically it's about greater than three months, although Anyone that's been in practice or seen these patients, you know, you know, sometimes it's even beyond uh, that three months. Uh, sometimes it's years of pain where these patients are coming in to see us. And pain persists despite conservative measures, and those vary. And more conservative measures are coming along, um, you know, by the day and the week and in the, the years. Um, we have a lot of different treatment options. Um, but usually these patients have some sort of, you know, physical therapy or corticosteroid injections or things like that um, into their uh, disease tendon or, or area. And really, minimally invasive tenotomy can be considered and, and executed and implemented for a lot of different body parts, um, any peripheral tendon, really. Um, in particular, the, the majority of what we see are shoulder pathology, whether it's biceps tendinopathy, proximal um, biceps tendinopathy, the long head of the biceps, or supraspinatus or cuff tendinopathy. I mean, the elbow, we have a very commonly common extensor, common flexor tendinopathy, and even distal biceps 
a tendinopathy as well and triceps tendinopathy. And the hip, uh, very commonly gluteal tendinopathy, in particular gluteus medius. Um, and the knee, and we see a lot of patella or, or quadriceps tendinopathy in the foot and ankle. Um, Achilles tendinopathy or plantar fasciopathy are really common uh, diagnoses that we see that we all should be considering to treat with uh, minimally invasive tendinopathy. And a lot of, if you have these patients, you see these patients in your practice, like a lot of us, uh, if you don't have a successful way to treat these patients now, then this, this presentation is really for you. You should open your ears and really be excited because I'm excited to talk about this um, because our field is growing, expanding, and more treatments are coming out day by day. And, and we're learning more about tendon pathology and how to treat it and really characterize it as you'll see later on in the discussion. So this is a really exciting time to be in this field of, of sports medicine. And, and I hope you're ex as excited as I am to kind of delve into this a little bit. Okay, you can go to the next slide. So as I mentioned, the typical presentation is overuse, um, not really a discrete injury or trauma for these patients. Um, patients are usually middle-aged, although that's not all-inclusive. Um, most likely long-standing, typically greater than three months, or like I mentioned earlier, a lot longer. A lot of these patients deal with tendon pain and, and issues for years um, before they uh, find a definitive diagnosis. These patients have failed conservative treatments, usually multiple uh, variations, iterations of these conservative treatments, whether it be manual or physical therapy, different types of bracing. Sometimes they'll come in with a, uh, a, a box full of their braces that they've tried and failed or they bought on the internet. And corticosteroid injections and repeated corticosteroid injections, um, repeatedly just injecting corticosteroid into the area because there's not a better treatment option um, that they've encountered um, speaking with their physician or the provider that's uh, managing their care. And these patients are really at their wit's end. We've seen it uh, time and time again. The pain creates disruption in activities of daily living, in their sports, in their leisure activities. So they're really suffering from poor quality of life, um, frustrations, maybe some depression because they can't do what they want to do or they can't be as active as they want to be. Um, maybe they're trying to lose weight and they just can't do it because they're having this chronic um, tendinopathy related pain. And we really need to do better for these patients. We really need to take ownership of their, of their care and really manage um, their treatment and be champions for their, for their pain relief. And that's kind of where minimally invasive uh, synonymy really sets in and, and sets us apart. Okay, Sunila, go ahead and advance to the next slide, please. So we've seen this case example time and time again. I think in my clinic today, I saw this maybe four times already. Um, with different variations on the age or, or the length of time, but this is kind of a, a treatment we've all, or a uh, case example we've all seen. So we had a 52-year-old female presented with three years of right lateral hip pain, and it was located over the greater trochanter of the femur, and radiated posteriorly toward the buttocks and down the right thigh. Horse was going up and down stairs, horse was laying on her right side, really kept her awake at night and she wasn't able to get good quality of sleep because um, you know she'd start out laying on her left side and then roll over on her right side and that would wake her up. Previous physical therapy and NSAIDs were without significant benefit and corticosteroid injection uh, three months prior uh, gave her some pain relief and then the pain returned. We'll go ahead to the next slide. So the exam was uh, as such, uh, the tenderness over the right greater trochanter of the femur and posteriorly as well. Uh, range of motion of the hip was intact. There was some pain lateral with um, active range of motion, active assist range of motion. The gluteus medius was tested and was weak, and there was also pain with activation. But the physical exam other than that was pretty much unremarkable. Differential, there's not a lot of things that happen on the lateral aspect of the hip with this type of physical exam, but we can say, you know, was it the old greater trochanteric bursitis or greater trochanteric pain syndrome? Um, or gluteal tendinopathy. So we ended up diagnosing her with uh, gluteal tendinopathy, and I'll kind of illustrate that a little in a little bit uh, as to how I came up with that diagnosis. Go ahead, Sunila, the next slide. So with that diagnosis, we had a discussion of options. So there's a range of options you can provide patients, um, and some they've already had, and, and uh, continued physical therapy, we offered that. You know, directed gluteal strengthening was an option for this patient because there was some weak 
gluteus medius musculature um, that was tested and found. Uh, the, the pro of that is you're staying very conservative, um, not very invasive, uh, something that, you know, with a good physical therapist uh, may improve. But the, the con of that was, you know, she's already done that for three years and had issues that whole time she's been dealing with it. Um, patients may, you know, want something quicker um, because they have been dealing with it for such a long period of time. And maybe they don't want to uh, continue with more physical therapy. Could always repeat the injection. We discussed the pros and cons of that. Steroid, how many injections of corticosteroid in and around a tendon is too many as we're doing more and more research and we're seeing things, you know, sometimes, you know, the best thing for the patient in the short term, maybe is a corticosteroid injection. The best thing for the long-term health of their tendon um, is not a corticosteroid injection. Could also consider orthobiologic injections, which are many pros to that. But one of the cons is you know, cost, out-of-pocket expense. Some people can't afford to pay for an orthobiologic injection. Hip arthroscopy and debridement, a very legitimate option, has tried physical therapy, has tried uh, time and activity modification and NSAIDs, and they can, this patient continued with pain, but there's a uh, downside of anesthesia and, and recovery time with hip arthroscopy and debridement. Um, and also minimally invasive tenotomy. So why is this a good treatment option for this patient? There's a lot of, of pros to this being uh, that it's minimally invasive. And a lot of times you can do this under local um, anesthesia. Um, there's a faster recovery time because the incision that is made is, is not a wide one and there's not a lot of tissue damage that occurs um, with this treatment. Go ahead to the next slide. So on sonographic evaluation, uh, the image was very similar to this. We saw the gluteus medius tendon, lateral facet of the greater trochanter of the femur, and we saw this big black area of hypocoked tissue. Uh, which is very consistent, um, and we'll touch on this a little later. Dr. King will touch on this uh, in a little more detail um, with degenerative tendon tissue in the area, um, which leads us to believe, you know, a corticosteroid injection um, by administering that again with a tendon that looks like this is, is really fundamentally misunderstanding the pathology and what's going on. Um, so go ahead to the next slide, Sunila. And what I mean by that is, the pathophysiology of this or overuse or chronic tendon injuries occur in areas where there's poor blood supply. And the features include some collagen separation, some tendon degeneration. And the tissue changes and the pain pathways are not accurately and not well described by the term tendonitis, which infers and really insinuates a inflammatory process, but this is more of a degenerative process uh, many times. So the, using this term and treating this term as an inflammatory condition perpetuates just the misunderstanding of the pathology. So we actually, we did uh, perform a minimally invasive tenotomy and the patient, um, we saw them back at two, six and 12 week intervals. So at the two week follow-up, the patient um, was doing well, had some improvement, about 30% improvement in, term of, in terms of pain relief was still not able to lay on her uh, right side. At the six week follow up, there was 75% improvement. The patient was returning more to activities of daily living and actually was uh, using the elliptical, which she really wanted to do um, with uh, some pain during and a little bit afterward, um, but was improved. And then at 12 weeks, actually, the patient stated that she was 95% improved, um, had not really any pain, was able to lay on her affected side, her right side, without much pain and uh, was very happy with the treatment outcome and, and getting her life back. It had been a three, it had been three long years of her dealing with this, this pain and this interference with her quality of life. And she was ecstatic um, to be able to be active again. So with that, I will turn this over to Dr. King to talk a little bit more about what I touched on with the sonographic findings that we saw in the office and just uh, really prepare yourselves for kind of thinking about this uh, and, and many tendons in a different way in terms of classif classification and pathology and treatment. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chris. And, and thank you, everybody, for joining on tonight. As uh, Chris had said, um, you know, th this is a passion for, for all of us on the, on the call because it's uh, an answer to a question that a lot of us have had for a while. It's, is we see a lot of tendinopathy. Many of you on the call uh, see this uh, in having a solution for patients 
uh, that is not only what we found in our hands to be effective, uh, but something that's pretty straightforward. It's a, it's a straightforward conversation with uh, patients about what their pathology is and how we're managing it with uh, the, the TenJet procedure. Uh, so we'll expand a little bit more uh, about that conversation with uh, patients. For those of you on the call, you shall be familiar with uh, what's on the screen with these ultrasounds of the common extensor tendon. For those of you who are not familiar with this, welcome to the wonderful world of tendinopathy. Uh, and uh, I think you'll, you'll be able to upskill yourself very quickly uh, within just a, a few short minutes of these presentations. Uh, so as you see at the top left, uh, common extensor tendon is a tendon across uh, the lateral epicondyle and, and radial head there. The arrows denote the top part of that tendon. And this is that normal, echogenic type of look uh, to the tendon. It's what we call a fibrillar pattern. Uh, it's essentially isoechoic throughout. It should look pretty similar. Uh, at the top right, this is a power Doppler signal showing neovascularization or new blood flow growth because of a chronic strain to that tendon. So that's a little bit more of an inflammatory type of tendon. When these patients come in, they're, it's hot, it's red, it's tender. That's the type of patient that comes in and you say, this, this is tendonitis. This looks like tennis elbow, common extensor tendonitis. At the bottom left, the stark difference from that big, hot, red, tender, swollen elbow is the dull, stiff, achy, tight tendon. Uh, and that's that echo, uh, that hypogenic focus that Chris was talking about. That's the tendinosis. That's the change from the type one fibers to the type three and type four. It's more elastic. It stretches more and it shouldn't. It should be a hard connection between the muscle and the bone. That's what tendons do. And we can identify that under ultrasound. And finally, if you have inflammation and you have degeneration, you can have that mixed picture in the, in the bottom right. The reason, again, to take a look at these four is to say, we see a lot of these patients in the office. This is not a difficult thing to be able to pick up on ultrasound. And we have a treatment that if you're already familiar with putting a needle under an ultrasound and getting it close to a tendon, you can do TenJet tomorrow. Uh, be, because you put the three of those things together and it actually makes a pretty nice recipe for having a high volume of patients for, and having something to do for them. To expand a little bit more on when we say this is an easy thing to pick up on ultrasound, Sunil, if you go to the next slide. So we asked ourselves, uh, how, how reliable are those features uh, to be able to be seen. So we looked at that hypoechogenicity, uh, what we identified as that tendinosis or that tendinopathic tissue, uh, hyperemia, uh, and then the rest of these uh, features. Big takeaway here, there's 50 uh, ultrasounds that were uh, done from an inter and intraoperative reliability standpoint by practice musculoskeletal radiologists, sports medicine trained uh, attendings, and sports medicine fellows. And we found uh, high reliability uh, across quite a few of these, but really focusing on that hypoechogenicity and the hyperemia. So this is uh, published in the Journal of Diagnostic Mental Sonography. We can get to the uh, article if you just request that through uh, Sunil, and we can get you a copy of uh, that as well. Uh, next slide. We used those findings along with the identification of uh, those different tissues to be able to come up with uh, this intratendinous content model. And I think this really uh, hits on what uh, Chris was saying about identifying the right patient. So when you apply the same treatments to uh, patients, when we see research studies about orthobiologics or about needling or physical therapy, and the inclusion criteria was greater than three months of lateral elbow pain, that, that really doesn't create a, a specific population of patients that we're applying a treatment to. Essentially, that's just chronicity. And we know we've seen patients who come in with just uh, go for tennis elbow. We've seen them come in with different presentations of tennis elbow. So tennis elbow alone has a lot of variability. And we feel that a lot of the variability that comes in these studies talking about the outcomes of different treatments comes from the variability of the content inside. So those four photos that we showed at the start, if we take a cross-sectional shot of each one of these. And we look at that left one, that normal tendon, just being nicely dense, regular, dense, regular connective tissue, type one collagen packed in there. As you get that chronic strain and that chronic signal that shows that power Doppler signal, that neovascularization in that second image, you're not losing any of the fibers. You're not creating little micro tears of these fibers. You're separating the fibers apart from each other and filling them in with something else. And this is the reason uh, why you have overall integrity inside each one of those uh, pieces of uh, tendon tissue. 
Um, the uh, next uh, couple of uh, images that, that uh, sh showed there, it looks like we advanced one, but go ahead and leave it on this slide because th this kind of brings it all home anyways, uh, Sunila. So the, uh, all of those images are on that right side. Each parts of those tissues are different, but the takeaway is in the absence of a tear, you're just moving those pieces of healthy tissue apart, those healthy type one collagen, and depositing something in that space. And that's either the hyperemia uh, or it's uh, the uh, underlying uh, uh, degeneration. Uh, and so the grading classification that we put uh, forward uh, with each one of these uh, different findings were a type one tendon being normal. Uh, essentially straightforward, there's no pathology, there's no tendinosis, there's no hyperemia. A type two is an overwhelmingly inflammatory tendon, that patient that comes in that seems hot, red, tender, swollen, and that's where it's a negative tendinosis and positive hyperemia. Type three would be just the opposite, right? This is that, that tight, more uh, dull, achy type of pain. You know, it hurts after activity, after, they, after somebody stops doing something for 15 minutes and they go to stand up and their Achilles is stiff as all get out. That's, that's that tendinosis. Uh, and then obviously you can have the mix between it. In our practice, we've seen uh, that those type three and type four tendons are the ones that respond best to TENJET, minimally invasive tenotomy, because we are debriding, resecting and removing that degenerative tendon tissue and allowing the tendon to, to reload. So to talk about some pearls around the approach to that patient and how to apply TENJET to those types of tendons, I'll hand that over to Nate. Hey, good, good evening. Uh, my name is Nate Holmes. And uh, again, thank everybody for joining. Um, you know, my background is straight private practice, entire career spent in an orthopedic setting. Um, so when I talk about pearls, it, it's always important for me to touch on practice development, um, offering this as a treatment algorithm for patients, um, while also very successful, is also a, an excellent practice economics piece. Um, about three years ago, I changed from a smaller orthopedic group to a much larger orthopedic group. Um, and being able to offer this as a treatment algorithm was a selling point to another group to come in. Um, this is something that is not in competition with orthopedic surgery. It is not in competition with the partners that I have. It, it really works in conjunction with. I mean, being go to an orthopedic surgeon, a joint specialist who's seeing chronic gluteal tendinopathy and it's driving them insane, they'll tell you that they don't have a good treatment option for it. If anybody's ever seen somebody who's had a ton of open gluteal debridements and repairs, they don't work well. Arthroscopic bursal surgery does not work well. Um, shoulder surgeons don't want to operate on calcific tendinopathy of the shoulder and create a rotator cuff tear, or at least good ones, and create a rotator cuff tear that they have to repair and recover over a long period of time. Um, so this is an, an excellent way to evolve a practice, and it, it really is a, an excellent practice development opportunity. Um, I'm going to spend some time talking specifically about how I do these, what I do these technique based wise. Um, for me, uh, this was an odd, when this, when this procedure sort of came about and started and I was a relatively early adopter, um, I came in out of fellowship. We would do just needle tenotomies in the office, you know, ultrasound guided, you've got tendinopathy, uh, we're going to work on needling this tissue to induce blood flow. I mean, these were the days of uh, needling with prolotherapy, which is, you know, obviously still around, but th this was the treatment algorithm. And then came, you know, start the start of the orthobiologic craze. But it was really, we're attempting to use a needle to debride some of this tissue. And this really became an easy add-on for me to use because it's the same general idea, identifying disease tissue with the ultrasound and then working on debriding that tissue. So. When we talk about setting up the room for one of these and getting set, I do all of these cases at an outpatient surgical center for a couple of reasons. Um, one, from an economic standpoint, it's better um, for me. Um, two, uh, you can do these under local anesthesia. You can do them in the office, uh, or you can do them under twilight anesthesia. I, when I first started in practice, when I first started doing these, I probably did 90% of my cases under local um, I'm a bit of a minimalist when it comes to medication, when it comes to patient exposure, it's the least, least I can do to get somebody better, the better off they are. 
as my practice has evolved, as I've done more, I started to talk to patients about, well, we could do this under local, or we could do this under a little bit of light anesthesia. And I was shocked to find the number of patients that wanted some degree of anesthesia. They wanted, wanted no, no real thought about what was going to happen. As they started doing that, cases became easier to do, right? So the only concern ever about local anesthesia for me is there's a subset of patients that'll get vagal to some degree, no matter what you do to them. There's a subset of patients that will not tolerate any discomfort well. And so if I'm doing a deep shoulder calcification, if, if I'm doing something where I'm going to be in tissue for a while, um, those are cases where I'll say, hey, maybe you should use a little bit of anesthesia so that I can do a more thorough job. The nice part about using that is that I don't have to worry about what the patient's feeling. I don't have to worry about if they get a little bit vagal, stopping, starting, extending a procedure time. I can go in and do as thorough a job on this tendon as I would like to. And the patient won't worry a bit about what's going on. Um, from a room setup standpoint, you know, it's a little daunting to get back into a surgical center or an operating room if you haven't been in one in quite a long time and you've been doing procedures in an outpatient, but it's relatively straightforward. Um, I leave the patients on the stretcher. I leave them, um, don't, there's no real need to transition them to a operating room table. We just wheel them in, leave them where they are. We drape them off. Um, I'll, I, I usually just use some degree of chloroprep and uh, to, to clean the area. And then I'll, I'll drape off the, the area of surgical concern. Um, I like to lay a full bed sheet um, uh, uh, drape across them. Most of them are laying down so that I can use that area to drag across um, my sterile devices. I is room set up slightly different based on body part, but in general, just like if you're doing an ultrasound guided injection, if you're doing a procedure in the office, easiest to place the ultrasound on the other side of the patient so you can look directly across them and look at the tissue at the same time. I like to place my um, TenJet machine on the, the uh, upside of the patient so that then I can pull the sterile tubing across that drape and utilize it to uh, treat the patient. I if I'm doing them in a straight local, I'll come in first and just use alcohol swabs to, to clean them off and do my local first and then step out and scrub in to give that local some time to take effect. If I'm doing it under twilight, then it's I use the local real time after I've got them prepped. In this setting, I think it's easiest to, to use that local for a couple of purposes. Yeah, when it's readily available, I like to use Repivacaine, um, but I'll, I'll use that local not only to anesthetize the patient for post-procedure, but I, I like to use that local essentially as a contrast agent, right? So when you're looking at it with the ultrasound, you can use that to hydrodissect tissue. You can use that to identify tissue planes. You can use that to identify areas uh, where you're going to have some of these longitudinal split tears, where you, you're going to find some of your pathologic tissue and help you delineate it better. Um, it's exceptionally helpful for that. So getting in there with that local first is going to help you orient yourself and delineate your tissue. Um, easiest to view most tendons that we're usually utilizing in a long axis approach. That was the, obviously the approach of the common extensor tendon that we were looking at that Dom was talking about there. Um, uh, I think that there's, there's some ergonomic tips here, but as with doing an injection in the office, anything else, making yourself comfortable and ease of access ergonomically is going to make you more successful uh, and easier to do. Um, from a technical standpoint of how do I use this uh, and, and what am I doing with it? It's you're going in, using your local, making a skin wheel, taking a, an 11 blade, making a very small incision. Uh, incision is a tough word for it for me, even at this point. The, the more I do, the smaller they get. Certainly don't need to, to hub that 11 blade all the way down to make a big incision. It's just a tiny little portal site because the tip of this device is needle tipped. Um, you got to get it through the skin and then it'll help you work through the rest of that tissue. Um, but it's a combination of sort of pistoning movements, same you would do with a needle tenotomy, same general technique you're using when you do a barbitage in the office for a, a calcific tendinopathy patient, uh, and, and adding in sort of rotational movement. If you look at the tip of the device uh, on the picture at the bottom here, it's needle tipped, and then there's that small sort of window where most of the work is done, you're using that high flow saline to create a pressure gradient to draw that tendinopathy tendinopathy and that, that abnormal tissue into that window to debride it and then aspirate it out. So you, you want to use a combination of rotational movement to get different planes of tissue um, that you're in. I, 
I talk about it all the time. You know, for me, I want to use the needle tip of this to hit some healthy tissue. I want to use it to hit it some tissue that's got some degree of blood supply because it's the breeding bad tissue out and inducing healing back to normal tissue. And we need blood for that. One well, part of the reason it's developed, as Don was talking about, as Chris was talking about, it, it's poor vascular supply to this area. It's part of the problem. So we want to induce healing afterwards. I, for a common extensor there, I like to take the tip of this device and needle the bone a little bit to you know, use the vascular of that bone to my benefit to induce a little bit of bleeding uh, to improve my my overall healing. Um, I think uh, we can advance to the next slide, Sunil. Um, I, at the same time, if people always ask me, how do you know when you're done? How do you know when, you're, when you've done enough? You're going to see ultrasound changes real time as you're doing it. Um, but for me, as much as that, it's the tactical feedback or the uh, tactile feedback that I'm getting when I'm doing these coming from doing just regular needling in the office. You know, when I teach the residents, when I teach the fellows, it's always the, the, the explanation that I use to, to get a better sense of it is, is putting a needle in healthy tendon tissue, which we've all done, you know, should feel like sticking a needle in an eraser. So you're going to get some very consistent, very regular um, feedback. You're going to get a little bit of resistance, but it's going to be kind of the same throughout. For lack of a better word, sticking a needle in tendinopathy feels crunchy. It feels abnormal. It doesn't feel smooth throughout. So part of the way I know I'm done tactilely is I'm no longer feeling that. I'm feeling sort of regular, consistent uh, tactile feedback throughout that whole tendon. Um, I use this a lot, a lot, a lot to, cre to treat calcific tendinosis. Um, as time has gone on for me, and Chris talked about his experience of an individual patient and uh, three months of symptoms and when he'll utilize this, uh, experience has taught me, and one of the pearls for me is, this is a treatment algorithm uh, that was, there was a treatment option that was way too far my, down my algorithm initially. I was treating patients that coming in with multi-year lateral hip pain, not getting better, had a bunch of injections. For me, if a patient's got pain that is somewhat chronic, you know, I'll, I'll do one steroid injection, I'll offer an injection, but it, it's exceptionally rare that I'm doing multiple corticosteroid injections on somebody. And somebody coming in with calcific tendinopathy, Certainly there is a subset of patients that'll do better with the steroid injection and I'll give them one, but if they have recurrent pain, this is the absolute almost immediate next thing on my list. And that's the one time where that three months of, of symptoms is, is not something that I'm looking for. If somebody has incomplete response to a steroid injection or recurrent symptoms with calcific tendinopathy, um, this is, I'm talking about this visit one as an option. Um, it, to me, Treating the true pain generator here is important. So I get the question a lot about, you know, what patient's got an anesthesified, patient's got a Haglund deformity, you know, are we going to use that to take this down? Do we need to get rid of that? And, and if you think about it, that, unless it's rubbing on the back of their shoe, that's not the pain generator here. This is the abnormal tendon tissue, the tendinopathy connecting to it is the pain generator. So if you deal with that, if you can get rid of that, patients get better. You don't necessarily need to go in and remove bone. You can use this the device to try to work that bone, but, but it's not what's going to get a patient better. Um, the, the picture on the right is a, a calcific tendinopathy patient that I did, right? So massive uh, uh, calcification in the cuff on the picture on the left, two-week post-procedure. So does an excellent job of debriding calcific tissue. I like to use it for calcific gluteal tendinopathy, calcific rotator cuff tendinopathy. Um, works well for both. Um, no major issues removing that tissue. And importantly, not doing damage to the normal tissue around it. Um, as Dom slide pointed out, what we're really working on removing here is non-functional, non-viable, non-healthy tissue. Um, so you can advance to the next slide. Um, and that gets to my biggest point here is not fearing harming diseased tissue. So for me, when I, you know, I'll do some cadaver courses, we'll do some preceptor courses where we're, we're going over procedural stuff with docs. The number one thing I think when people get started is this uh, desire to very gently take this device, put it on an area of tendinopathy, step on the foot pedal, let it run for a couple of seconds and think, have I done enough? Am I doing too much? Am I harming this tissue? This device is going to get rid of diseased non-functional tissue. So 
my advice usually is be a little more aggressive than you think you're going to needle this tissue as you add it. You want to get rid of all of this non-functional disease tissue. Um, this is a picture of a case that I did last year. Um, obviously, the uh, picture on the left is an enormous um, calcification in pretty much the entire quadricep uh, tendon. It's a patient, a decade of symptoms had seen um, specialists at every orthopedic specialty hospital there was, had a, a lot of pain, uh, issues with daily living, issues with walking, issues with hiking, um, and essentially was told, we don't have a good option for you. Uh, it, it, if you think about this surgically, if you went in and tried to debris this thing um, in an open procedure, there's no way anybody's going to do that without, without having a graft sitting right next to them because you're going to need to essentially take out this entire quadriceps tendon. Um, and it, not good. Um, even having done a lot of these, I looked at this thing and said, I'm a little concerned about the size of this thing. Um, the picture on the right is post-procedure with no knee pain and, and complete functional improvement. Um, but you can see, that, get in there, get rid of this diseased tissue. You're going to leave the healthy stuff behind. I got to admit that when this patient uh, woke up from the, I did use Twilight for this patient because it took me a while and I worked this tissue for quite some time. Um, I sighed a big, deep breath when she extended her knee against gravity after I did it. Um, but you want to get rid of this abnormal disease tissue and it's okay to be a little aggressive in attempting to do that. Um, I'll, I'll touch on, you know, post-procedurally, we're going to get into that and Dom's going to talk about it in a second. Um, but when I talk to these patients about healing time, about things, about how we're going to treat this, and this is a treatment option. One of the things that we often talk about um, is the role of orthobiologics for treating tendinopathy, either isolatedly or in conjunction with this. Um, and if people have questions on it, we can certainly talk about that um, in the questions, question and answer time. Um, but one of the things that I will offer them is to do the procedure and follow it up with PRP to induce a little bit of better healing response afterwards. Um, there's a little bit of art to that discussion. Um, my favorite thing to do is get rid of disease tissue and follow it up with orthobiologic treatment to, to try to induce healing here. I don't know that it's necessary in every case, but it's certainly part of the discussion. Um, but I, know, I think now I want to turn it back over to Dom because he's going to spend some time talking about what we do to these people afterwards after the procedure has, has been completed. Thanks, Nate. And, uh, you know, I think it's a it's a nice transition because as Nate said, and I think that probably the, the, the best takeaway in that the one slide that he had with that quad tendon is don't fear harming diseased tissue. The tissue is, is already diseased. Likewise, the other side of that coin is after you've removed that diseased tissue, don't fear reloading healthy tissue. That's what healthy tissue wants to do. It wants to be loaded. Um, loading it properly and being cautious is the key. So what's on the screen here is probably the most conservative recommendations around each one of these areas. And the high level takeaway is that we want patients to ramp up back up to their activity while trying to avoid them getting a tendonitis. Because if they load their, their, their tendon in a way that they were loading before at the same level of activity that they had before, too quickly, that's what they could uh, re really develop. And I think in, in the, our conversations around the consent of this procedure prior to and the risks and the alternatives, the, there is not a high risk of rupture of these tendons. The tendon's already at a high risk of rupture because of tendinosis and hyperemia weakening intratendinously, and the fact that the healthy fibers are not close enough to each other to load appropriately. The biggest risk I think a lot of us talk about with patients is, if, if you push too much, too quick, uh, too soon, you're going to get a tendonitis. You're going to be back in our office saying, hey, why does this, why does this hurt? And we'll say, well, what, how much did you load it? So these phases are general around how the patient is certainly feeling at each one of these time periods. So for upper extremities, typically we will not sling anybody. Uh, you, you know, you, we want them to start gentle range of motion to gravity same day. Uh, you know, as soon as they get done, as, as Nate said, you know, start extending the knee. We can tell that it works. It's functional. Wonderful. We're going to get you back onto your, your, your feet very soon. With upper extremity, taking out a big piece of calcium inside the shoulder, we have them go through range of motion right after the procedure. Make sure, let, let's see if we can get you any, any better motion. We're not pushing and we're not trying to, you know, get them back to heavy loading in any way, shape, or form. But we're also trying to emphasize to the patient, we didn't do anything to your healthy tendon tissue. 
we removed the degenerative tendon tissue and the small amount of potential healthy tissue that we went through to get to that tendinosis, we were able to devise that and divide it with the, the, the sharp needle tip of that, that device. Certainly such a small amount less of any kind of damage that would ever be done inside the tendon and some really good uh, supporting evidence that there is no damage to healthy tendon tissue with this device, opposed to some other uh, devices or approaches that are out there. Important thing for the lower extremities, I put somebody on crutches and put them in a boot uh, if it's an Achilles or a plantar fascia. Same thing uh, with the patellar quadriceps. I'm not going to have them really put uh, too much uh, weight on that. Gluteal tendons, it takes more work for them to hike up their hip than it takes for them to uh, put weight on it. So they can put weight on it uh, initially. Uh, and as we were preparing for this, you know, Nate, Nate had asked that too. He goes, you don't really put people on crutches that soon. I say, no, no, no. I give them crutches and I tell them, if it's uncomfortable, go ahead and, uh, you know, take some weight off it. But I agree with uh, Nate and kind of the conversation we had when we were prepping for this is that majority of patients, even for an Achilles or a plantar fascia, within, even if I give them a boot, within about two to three days, they said, I felt so comfortable in the boot, I took it off. I, I wore a nice, comfortable tennis shoe, and then they started physical therapy at week three. So I would say there are some people who come in with some significant retrocalcaneal bursitis with Achilles tendons, and that was just a very hyperemic tendon. Uh, those are ones that we can tell them, listen, it's it might take you six to eight weeks longer to recover than somebody else who didn't have that kind of inflammation. And you may feel some discomfort a little bit sooner than later, but I'm still planning on them starting physical therapy at week three or at the very least week four, because we want to load that healthy tissue again. So once again, that big takeaway, don't fear reloading healthy tissue, just be cautious about how much and how quickly you reload it. Because I think the biggest side effect that you'll have in the patients coming back saying that they had an adverse effect are not gonna be at the time of the procedure or the, the days after. They're gonna call maybe three weeks or four weeks later or seven weeks once they felt really good and they just pushed it a little bit too quickly. So that go low, you know, start slow kind of adage works really well here, but we expect people to be pretty active within the first month. Um, depending on the level of pathology, the level of hyperemia, the level of surrounding bursitis or other medical conditions, orthopedic conditions that they have around that joint, they may see three to four months to really be able to pass judgment on it. Uh, but most people, by the time you see them back in the first visit, at, at uh, somewhere between six or eight weeks are telling you that they can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, so with, with this, uh, I think we're going to, this is giving uh, Nate some time to review some of the questions that have come up. Uh, please be open, you, you know, ask questions. Uh, the, the last piece I'll, I'll say is when we were prepping for this as well, uh, you know, Nate, myself and Chris, we were talking about uh, you know, we, we've had a lot of experience with musculoskeletal ultrasound and a ton of experience with this device. We've also had our opportunity of putting a needle in the skin and then having it go outside of the skin and then hit the probe on the other side. And I think if you've never done that before and screwed up that royal way with doing an injection, you just haven't injected enough uh, body parts. So we've been at every level of anybody who's on, uh, on this call and, and certainly uh, we're, we're all humble enough to, to uh, admit it. Uh, so please, no, no question is, is too off base for uh, what you can ask. So I'll uh, change this back over to, uh, to Nate to moderate our uh, Q&A. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I'll start with a super simple one because um, someone asked with that quadricep tendon, um, uh, do we approach from multiple incision site or one? That was a single incision site. I, I basically came up far enough from the patella that I thought I could reach the tip of that uh, calcification and I worked it in one direction and then I took the device out and found a more proximal portion of the calcification um, and just worked in the other direction from the incision. So I was able to do that case through a single incision. Um, there are times when multiple incisions are necessary. You know, uh, you'll if I'm you're doing a rotator cuff that's got calcific tendinopathy or tendinopathy in in more than one tendon. If you're trying to approach a supraspinatus and then you you've got to get into a subscap, I'll often make a second incision for that. Um, interestingly, you know, uh, we might, we're not gonna we can talk about a little bit more practice economics wise, but. A multi-tendon code for this is a much better payer. So um, if there's more than one tendon to work on, make, making a second incision essentially doubles your surgical code, uh, which has helped from a payment standpoint, uh, but it wasn't necessary on this one. Um, uh, someone asked uh, concerns on damage um, to the tendon uh, with a needle tip pistoning. 
Um, I mean, this device is slightly larger um, than an 18 gauge needle that you would use to do a barbitage with. Um, you're going to pass through some healthy tissue to get there. You're going to pass through some fat. You're going to, you know, you'll feel yourself pop through uh, the fascial layer. Um, normal healthy tissue is resilient to that. Um, th the needle will push through that um, the same as any needle would. Uh, but there's no concern for damaging healthy tissue with the actual action of the device. The, uh, there's very good safety data on that. Um, there's pretty good data on cranking this thing up and running it on healthy tissue. Um, and there's some pathologic slide uh, slides that can be provided to look at um, that essentially show that we're not damaging healthy tendon tissue with this. Um, Nate, someone... I can jump in. Uh, let me jump yeah. in a second here. Um, so just with your point on the quadriceps and making one incision. So um, in our specialty, uh, I think the ultrasound is really a, um, it's amazing tool we have, not only as Dom touched on for diagnosis and classification, um, but also in the procedural setting in order to one, make it a minimally invasive procedure and one incision, but also your procedural planning, you were able to identify, I wasn't there with you with this, but I probably know what you did because I've done the same thing. You were able to identify the length of that lesion, the width of that lesion before you even made a plan as to where you were going to make your incision. So you were able to really identify that, that uh, lesion in its entirety without opening up the patient at all and really have that plan in place and you know what type of needle and, and what length you're working with. And so you could really plan your procedure around a single incision or uh, conversely, if you needed a second incision, you know that before you even started. So that's really the amazing thing about um, ultrasound and uh, this treatment technique um, and using those combination, the combination of the ultrasound and the device to really get a great outcome for the patient um, with uh, a relatively fast recovery time. So I just wanted to add that. Yeah, great, uh, uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, several questions on here about surgical centers. Um, and I'll just take this myself um, because I'm fairly in tune with this. Um, uh, questions about getting privileges, um, not difficult uh, in my experience. Uh, I've had privileges at multiple surgical centers that I've done this at. Um, they're going to want to investigate what the procedure costs to get done, what they're billing on it. And if they, they can make money, then they will let you do it there. Right? Surgical centers are um, different place to place, um, academic institutions versus private ones, but they're for-profit centers. They're there to generate revenue. And if you can make, generate revenue for them, they're all for it. Um, to get block time, you're going to need to obviously prove a volume. Um, the volume is there. If you don't think the volume for this is there in your practice, I would disagree because it, it is there in probably everyone's practice. Um, I have block time at my surgical center every other week. Um, I'll do eight cases in a morning. Um, economically, that works. You know, the reimbursement on this is enough that I can take a morning every other week, go do eight cases and be back in the office and generate enough revenue to make up for it. Uh, I've been lucky, uh, I would say, in that it, from an economic standpoint, you do have these cases at a surgical center, then there's the potential to buy shares in a surgical center. And if anybody on the call has them or has been offered them, they would clearly obviously tell you that that is probably the best financial investment you can ever make from a passive in income revenue standpoint. Um, so it, it is equitable financially to do that. Um, uh, some questions about billing. Um, there's a specific subset of tenotomy codes to use for this. Um, by definition, it's a surgical tenotomy code. Um, Chris and I spent some time doing some case reports um, uh, that we submitted to the AMA um, to have them um, look at and see if the, the code was appropriate. Chris, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so um, that's uh, a really, really good question. And that's if you, if you can't keep the lights on, then uh, yeah, you're not, you're, if you're not billing and, and coding correctly. So, so uh, we did submit some case reports to the AMA and, and, and really we can provide those to you. Sunila can, can provide those to you at, at request. But I think the take home message with um, procedural documentation, billing and coding is one, having an open dialogue with your coder. If you don't know your coder, you should probably get to know them and talk to them. 
because they're looking for uh, specific things in terms of how they are um, submitting your codes. And they're not there while you're doing the procedure. And you're not sitting with them and, and us as physicians, uh, we don't get trained particularly in, okay, what needs to be in the note to, to bill and document. So, so my first take on point is, is that, is create a dialogue just like you have with your colleagues and your surgical colleagues and your non-surgical colleagues and your, and your primary care physicians. Create that dialogue with your coder because that would be of some great benefit. Be, um, you may not be accurately describing your procedure if you're having issues um, with billing and coding. Um, you may be describing it in a way that makes sense to you, but to the coder, they're interpreting that in a different manner. So um, really having that conversation and really honing in on um, what they're looking for and what they need and really um, analyzing what you're doing um, with the procedure and accurately describing that um, in your note um, for comprehensive uh, uh, billing and coding um, outcome, comprehensive and complete billing and coding outcome. Um, we, can, we can provide you with the AMA stuff. Um, I'm sure Sunila would be happy to do that. Um, but that's my, uh, that's my um, suggestion after having done a, a couple thousand of these and, and worked with a, working with a few different coders is that dialogue needs to be there. And um, if you're having issues, it's probably something to the effect that um, it's either inappropriately or not completely um, described and the coder is uh, having a little bit of issue with that. But that dialogue really uh, solves a lot of problems and a face-to-face -face dialogue is way better than a, an email back and forth. I don't know if Dom or Nate, you wanna add anything to that? Uh, I think that's appropriate. Dom, I, I wanted to turn to you. Um, there were some questions uh, about uh, uh, trials and uh, data um, to support this. Um, and uh, yeah. I guess we'll start with you with that. Yeah, I'll, I, and I think I'll jump in on, on that. I saw another one that, that talked about 10X versus 10Jet and, and they've had uh, good hands in, in several years of using 10X prior to using this as well. Um, in terms of research and, and outcomes, I, I think the question was, you know, the surgical center versus the uh, procedure room. Um, you know, I, I could see that maybe, uh, you, I, I don't know, I, well, I'm fairly confident that there's not been any research that's been done to look at just the difference between the two. Other than immediate patient experience uh, during the uh, procedure, I, I wouldn't foresee that there would be uh, a significant difference in overall outcome uh, for that. However, we do record a baseline and follow-up uh, joint specific uh, score uh, prom at uh, six months and 12 months. So what's on the screen here uh, is just some early unpublished data that we have uh, from the uh, from uh, the clinic. Um, uh, it pretty much, it's, it, we've reached this uh, statistical significance in, in all of our uh, proms uh, at six months uh, from baseline. Uh, the the area where we really dove in uh, quite a bit was uh, the hoose for the gluteal tendon. So Sunil, if you click forward, I, I think maybe one slide, um, there, there's some pre-published data that we're uh, uh, sending uh, submitted for publication. Yeah, that's a, that, that's the one here. So it didn't look like there was any, uh, or there was no statistical significance change from six months to 12 months. Uh, however, all of these scores, while improved, it did sustain. So we know that within six months, the vast majority of people get uh, the improvement that we're looking for. Um, and that improvement was statistically significant from baseline to six months and then maintained out through uh, 12 months. Uh, so it, it's, uh, you, you will be seeing more studies like this come out uh, because we are able to now start to qualify the type of tendon that we're treating. Um, and I think this was... One of, the, one of the things that, uh, j just making the leap over to uh, 10X is, as well, um, <clears throat> we, we have you know, partners in DenJet now that are dedicated to wanting to understand this science and this outcome. Um, having my hands at several years of using 10X prior to 10Jet, uh, if you're familiar with 10X uh, in the way that it uses, uses uh, ultrasonic energy, it, it violently shakes the tendon to kind of dislodge the tendinosis from the healthy tendon that's around it, coats it in water, and then tries to suck it out through the inner lumen of the device. And, it, and I describe it that way because that design causes it to get clogged very easily. 
Um, for one of those reasons, it can also overheat uh, for after using it for about two to three minutes. And the needle tip overall may be too short to reach certain body areas like the gluteal tendon, the hamstring tendon, the, and some shoulders. And, and happy to have uh, Nate and, and Chris talk about their experience if they've used 10X as well. 10Jet, on the other hand, it's, it's longer, uh, more than long enough to get inside any tendon of the body. Uh, it doesn't overheat. And it doesn't get clogged because it's using a high pressured stream of saline to directly resect and remove that tendinosis. So making the switch for, for me from 10X to 10Jet was pretty simple because 10Jet filled all of the design gaps that uh, 10X made in terms of effectively removing that degenerative and disease tissue. I can uh, add to that as, as well. I, I would echo what, what Dom uh, said. Um, the other thing that uh, I really like about using the 10 jet device um, over 10x and I use 10x for a couple years um, is the sonographic image um, and what it looks like throughout the entirety of the procedure you can really uh, continually visualize that hypocoic that degenerative tendon tissue with the 10 jet device without um, let's say the saline obstructing or uh, altering what your sonographic image uh, looks like. So, so I would add to what Dom said in terms of uh, the differences that, um, that I see is that I like the real-time sonographic visualization, how you can track that throughout the entire procedure without uh, sailing kind of obscuring that. Yeah, I think those are the big the take-home points. I've, I've used both as well um, and used 10X prior to this. Um, ran into some of the same issues, you know, and it, I, the other thing that I would tell you is it, I would at times get a decent amount of overspray from the device, the tissue, as Chris was saying, would change on ultrasound because of the fluid, um, but just would get boggy and would get full and uh, patients would get soaked and it would be feel, the tissue would feel very full and boggy afterwards. And I think that would induce a little more inflammatory response. I post-procedurally, I, I found, and this is not data-driven, this is just anecdotal, more irritation of that soft tissue in the area because of the fluid retention. Um, there's some specific cost questions about how much the device costs. Um, and I think I'm gonna, we're gonna defer those to the company because I honestly, I don't even think I could answer that. Um, uh, certainly afterwards, uh, can, can put in contact with Sunil and, and she can answer very specific economic um, questions about device costs, what that looks like. I think that uh, I, I'm not prepared to answer that. Um, I think that it, this is, um, and there's been several uh, questions about doing this in the office. Um, it's easy enough to do in the office. You can do it under local. Um, it's not more complicated than procedures that you're doing in the office, except for creating a sterile field. Um, economic reasons can drive that sometimes, reimbursement reasons, uh, procedure code versus um, site fee codes to, to help pay for the cost of the device. Um, Cash-based practice, uh, you want to charge patient cash to do these, um, absolutely bring them to the office, tell them this is how much it costs and, and do it. Uh, but th those economic pieces are reasons to look at doing these in an outpatient surgical center versus doing them in your office. Um, yeah, I would, I would echo that, you know, the way uh, everything that Nate, you just said, the, the way that you do the procedure, um, and I've done some in the office uh, previously, um, and I do all mine under local anesthesia. Um, the, really, the only thing that changes is the address um, of where you're doing uh, the procedure, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, setup and all that type of stuff. Sometimes uh, I use a procedure room at the uh, inventory surgery center where I do the, do my, uh, tenonomies. And so that is not much different in terms of, uh, what the surrounding environment looks like and feels like than the office setting. Agree. Just to chime in from my standpoint as, as well, uh, mine are all done in a, a procedure room at an ASC. Um, they're all done in a local, um, you know, we're pushed, uh, you know, from a large institution standpoint, um, from a value-based care standpoint. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think I agree with Nate and I can definitely identify the patients who I probably may have preferred to have at least a little bit twilight uh, on, but you kind of talk them through uh, the, the anesthesia 
process, but uh, for the vast majority of, uh, of, of patients, a couple seconds to, to numb them up uh, isn't bad, but well, I didn't have the option anyways, uh, from a value-based care standpoint to add the anesthesia uh, onto it. So it really is very specific to your practice location and how either your institution or practice is going to approach it. That So I think both, both the guys mentioned in, in great detail and review, how you want to make sure to have this reviewed by a biller and coder who are in your office, um, because each situation is going to be slightly unique. Great. Thanks, Tom. Um, uh, question about pre and post ultrasounds for billing. Um, when I bill these at the surgical center, I bill them with the zoning code and I bill them with the ultrasound guidance code. Uh, for that reason, I take a picture of the, the body part that I'm working on prior to it, just like any injection that you're going to bill. Um, don't need a images of the procedure, just need a, images to prove that you were looking at the right body part. No need for post-procedure images. Uh, we like to take them because we like to say, hey, look what I did. Hey, look, look what we, we look at you, look at you afterwards, look at you now compared to before, but they're unnecessary. Um, a question regarding um, uh, level to set the device on. There's multiple settings uh, on, on the device. Um, Level seven, as you indicated, is what I use as a workhorse for most of the procedures I do. If I'm having difficulty cut it, getting through tissue, um, I'll turn it up. If I'm going to work on some bone uh, and really try to, to get in there and beat it up a little bit, I'll turn it up. Um, but in general, that's where I set the device for most of my work. There's safety data um, that's excellent on that setting um, for healthy tissue. Um, I don't know, Chris or Dom, do you have any uh, differing opinions on on changing um, the device setting as you're using it. Um, I'll echo uh, Nate what you said in terms of if there's uh, an issue uh, with the tissue or debriding the tissue, you know I will go up. I usually uh, run it on seven um, as well. Uh, it's really something that I guess you could run it on eight or you could run it on nine or you could run it on ten or you could run it on six if you um, chose. To do such, um, the data on seven uh, in terms of safety and and my comfort and my level of procedures I've done at that uh, setting um, is is really uh, kind of what I do. It's it's the kind of thing where it, I've done it that way and it's worked well that way, and I continue to do it that way. Um, so I would echo that. I'm kind of comfortable with what it feels like, how long it takes me on average to get through that um, type three and four collagen. Um, to really debride that that tissue uh, effectively. Um, so that's kind of what I'm most comfortable with and what I've, I've done for a long time. And I'd say probably my, my experience with that is is similar, but we'll, I'll turn it up to 10 when we're priming uh, to just get it to prime a little bit quicker. If it's a uh, area that you know you're going to be spending some time in, uh, like a, a pretty extensive calcium uh, deposit, you know, you're, you're you're, you're going to end up hanging another bag of saline if you're going to be working for that long. So sometimes just to get started, I'll take it to maybe like a four or a five, uh, just to know that I'm going to end up using saline uh, less quickly, uh, just to get a better feel of, of how far I can go and how quick I can go and if I can get through the tissue uh, with a, a lower setting. Um, but for that, uh, I'll ask Nate back on that quad. Uh, did you go through one bag or two bags or seven bags? How, how many, uh, how much saline did you go through with that? I was going to say eight bags on that quad. <laughs> that was the, that was the two and a half liters. Um, but, but to that point, I would tell you that, you know, hey, the, and the, the question, I, I, I will start doing it as you said, because I'm all in private practice. I'm all about um, efficiency and generating because that's the world that I work in. And um you know, I can get through most of these cases with a half liter. Um, that's what I use. I'll hang another one if I go through it. Um, but I think that's enough. I would, uh, and I, I, I meant to touch on it earlier, um, but from a, a flow standpoint, um, I book these for 30 minutes at the surgical center a piece, including turnover. Um, and that's humming, that's moving, that's having a team that's done a bunch with me. Um, but in skin time for me for these is five, seven minutes. Um I think you can get your flow down to you know, 30 minutes is enough to do one of these. And that's coming in, talking to a patient in pre-op, wheeling them back, doing a case, dictating it while the room's turning over, walking out, talking to the next one in pre-op. After the first one, and my patients, again, a lot of them are getting a little bit of anesthesia. So by the time I'm done with the next case, I can go talk to the patient that's now fully with it and just cycle and repeat. Um, and if you're efficient in moving through that, I think 30 minutes of 
blocked OR time, including turnover, is enough. Maybe not for your first case ever, um, but you should be able to efficiently move through those. And some of these practice economics uh, questions about, you know, is this economically viable to take a half day out of the office every couple of weeks and do them? At that rate, um, my obviously everybody's contracts are different. Everybody's payments are slightly different, but for sure, for me, um, not just is this a good treatment? Is this a good you know, thing to treat tendinopathy, it, does it work well? And can I get my patients better? But economically, uh, it has worked very well for me. It has driven revenue into the practice and it has driven revenue directly to me. And I can bring in enough doing that to justify a half day out of the office for sure. Um, so that was the question that literally just popped up on my screen too. How much time are you blocking per procedure? Um, for me, it's 30 minutes. I think if I hadn't done a ton, I think when I first started, I blocked 45 minutes of procedure. Um, what, what are you guys blocking off for these? So I'll, um, I, my, my flow is a little bit different. I do 25 and I have an APP with me. I have a PA that, that works with me that will actually, I have two procedure rooms and I do a couple other procedures, but this is the, you know, kind of the, one of the bulks of my procedure days. I'm all of an APP and, and the room uh, localizing the tissue uh, with ultrasound uh, marking, prepping, anesthetizing the patient while I'm doing a procedure in the other room. And really I can, I can get through this very quickly. So teaching someone, uh, to help aid in your workflow is also an option, um, uh, for doing this because localizing that tissue as Dom already touched on. Um, once you, you see it and, and you recognize it, your eyes, you can't unsee it. Your eyes go right to that tissue um, it's really, really in a predictable place and you're just kind of changing the body part you're working on. Um, but I'm 25 minutes and I kind of run two, uh, rooms, uh, uh, going from one room to the other with my, my APP kind of running ahead of me, kind of prepping the area and really makes for a nice, efficient, um, work day and a lot of good patient, uh, contact, uh, experience and, and, and time with, uh, either myself or my PA. And, uh, I, I kind of, maybe as a third model, um, so I, I do this as, as a set aside procedure day, uh, which I think probably, probably both Nate and Chris do as well. But on these days, I'll, I'll double book somebody uh, at, the, at like a 45 minute. So what I mean by double book is I'll have a 10 jet case on uh, for 45 minutes, but then I'll also have another patient there for whether it's a flex injection or a different ultrasound guided injection or like a PRP or orthobiologic. Uh, pull blood, start spinning, and then have them back in there. And I agree with both, what both guys said. Procedures definitely could be done 25, 30 minute. Uh, simple because you're you're really only spending about five minutes uh, at max uh, in, in skin time. Uh, but it's, it's enough that there's enough to do before and after, whether it's instruction or just conversation, uh, if it's done in an outpatient setting, where you could have something else going on that day uh, as well, even if it's just set up for a bunch of other injections while the room's getting turned over. Yeah, and that, there was a question earlier about, um, you know, anesthetic, you know, I obviously it was used local at the site. Um, I will, and I don't know what you guys can, can speak to as well. I, once in a while, I'll do a block as well. You know, if I've got a particularly flared up, already miserable, crazy pain, calcific tendonitis patient that's huge and I'm going to do a decent amount of work on, it would not be uncommon for me to throw a suprascapular nerve block while I'm there um, just to help with some of the post-procedural soreness, um, to help with how they're feeling afterwards. I, I find when I do that, they wake up feeling great. Um, I don't do a ton otherwise, but that is certainly one that I'll throw in the mix at times. Um, no rhyme or reason. I think if, if they're, they're feeling particularly bad beforehand, I'll do it. Uh, and I think it helps afterwards, uh, but not certainly not every time. You guys have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I don't utilize uh, really any regional anesthesia. Um, the, the one uh, thing that I change, if I'm doing a plantar fascia, I'll, I'll do a longer acting anesthetic uh, versus lidocaine, uh, kind of a mixture. Um, but I, I really don't really have a necessary uh, uh, need for, I don't have a need for regional anesthesia with all of these. They do really well. Yeah, I, I agree. I, uh, I think I always look at it as saying, it, you know, hey, this is going to hurt. First part's going to hurt. It's going to take me about 10 seconds to, to, to do and we're going to be done with it. Uh, and as a reference point back, if somebody at, you know, eight weeks or 10 weeks is saying, hey, I'm feeling pretty sore. 
Uh, and I'll say, well, are you feeling as bad as when I numbed up your tendon? And they go, well, no. I said, okay, are you better than you were when we started this procedure? Yes, all right. So then, then we start talking about how therapy's been going and how we might have been pushed it a little bit, um, but it, it's a, a little frame of reference as well, a little pain sebo to, to kind of see the other other side of it. But I would say majority of people are, are pretty comfortable with it. But uh, Nate, I, I will say for some of the larger calcium deposits in the shoulder uh, that we've uh, removed, I've, I've certainly done uh, suprascapular uh, blocks as well. Um, great. And there was a, a specific question uh, about hamstring tendons um, and approach. Um, you know, most of the hamstrings that I do are almost always um, hamstring origin, um, right at the ischial tuberosity. Uh, the question was specifically about um, uh, placing the tip um, of the device. And I do them, I do all my hamstrings in long axis, right in line with the hamstring tendon. I put the, put the probe on the tuberosity, right? Looking at the origin of the hamstring, that's where, in my experience, you'll find most of the disease. Um, and then I follow the line of my anesthetic in short axis directly down to it. Um, do you guys have any different pearls of approach for proximal hamstring? Yeah, I'd say, I mean, the, the way we approach it is very, very similar, kind of a, like a lateral decubitus. I'll have them bring their knees as, as far up to their chest and in their belly as they can. Um, I do it longitudinal in plane, but I come at it from superior. Um, that's the way we've been doing a lot of our uh, issue of gluteal bursa injections as, as well. And from that way, I mean, the, the biggest patient that I've had was the BMI of 60. Um, and it's still, as you get them into that position, is not that far underneath the skin. You can palpate almost everybody's ischial tuberosity. So coming in that direction keeps you from uh, you know, getting in the way of a sciatic nerve coming from lateral. Um, and, and I think it's an easy way to, to drop right onto the tendon. And with the 10X, I've had issues in the past with 10 jet, the size of the, the length of the needle, I haven't had an issue getting into even, even some larger patients' hamstrings. Yeah, I just, I come the opposite direction and, and my rationalization for doing that uh, is a vain one, particularly with some of the folks that I'm doing athlete-wise is I can then, essentially hide my little incision in the gluteal fold a little bit better. Um, and that's roughly why I'll make it to get there. Um, and not that it's a big incision, not going to cause a scar or it's going to cause much. They're going to struggle to find it afterwards, but people are vain. And if I tell them I can, if they're going to get anything, I'm going to hide it in their gluteal fold there pretty well, then that they, they tend to appreciate that. Yeah. One thing that I'll add, it's not really, I, I, um, I just want to add that sometimes the pathology or the diagnosis is not clear and hamstring proximal hamstring in particular, sometimes it's pretty straightforward, but sometimes there's a question. Is it, you know, piriformis is a proximal hamstring. You know, a lot of people you'll scan their proximal hamstring and you'll see pathologic tissue. You'll scan their contralateral unaffected uh, non-painful side and you'll see some pathologic tissue. Um, so one thing that I've utilized, and I don't know, you guys might echo this or might disagree is, you know, I use a, a corticosteroid injection with some anesthetic uh, for two purposes in, in some of these scenarios. Um, one, we're, we're treating, um, but two, that's really a diagnostic aid for me. If I see pathologic tissue, I think uh, that's the problem. Um, they haven't had any treatment, injectable treatment. Um, I will use a corticosteroid with some anesthetic to inject the area and monitor the response. So I'll see them back in four to six weeks from the injection. And if they tell me, hey, I felt great for a month, pain went completely away. Um, I did that ultrasound guide and I know exactly where I put it. And then the pain returns. Um, then I will uh, talk about uh, minimally invasive tenotomy with the 10 jet device to, to breed that area. So, so in some, uh, some scenarios where maybe the diagnosis is in question, you're not exactly sure, utilize, like I said before, utilize that ultrasound to localize the pathologic tissue. And if you don't like to use corticosteroid in and around tendon, then use anesthetic and tell the patient to go about their day. And if they get great relief and the pain returns, then you can more confidently recommend um, the treatment, the minimally invasive tenotomy to really address their issues, knowing that tendon is the culprit for their pain. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that as well. Yeah, we end up seeing a lot of issue femoral impingement that masquerades as uh, hamstring origin, uh, tendinosis. Um, you know, in those cases, fe feeling very confident about it being, you know, uh, an injection into the issue of femoral space versus 
uh, ischial gluteal bursa, or even some like sciatic nerve tethering underneath the piriformis. You know, I mean, posterior gluteal pain is, it can be a diagnostic, uh, you, you know, effort, um, but it is very valuable once you get it right. But being familiar with those areas, I, I, I agree, is, is important because we treat a lot of hamstrings that end up coming back in. And it was ischiofemoral impingement looking us in the face the whole time. Uh, so I think taking that good diagnostic step in, in patient selection um, for that and for all the other parts of the body. I mean, there's an issue from all impingement for every part of the body uh, that kind of masquerades a, a little bit. And so that's what all of us on the call as, you know, diagnosticians love, uh, love seeing and what a lot of you on the, that have attended like as well, which is probably why you're interested in this as a procedure. Great. Uh, anybody have any other questions? I think I got everything in the, the chat. Um, if I miss anything, uh, speak up. Um, or if there's any other questions that we can answer. If not, I'd just like to thank everybody um, for, for attending tonight and, and that, thank these guys for getting on the, the chat and, and sharing their, their clinical experience and obviously thanking Sunila for, for putting this together. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Holmes and Dr. Yang and Dr. Varakalo for doing our talk today. And, uh, and thank you to all the attendees and for your excellent questions. And please stop by at AMSSM will be there, or if you're in Massachusetts, uh, we are local, but we have reps everywhere. And we look forward to helping you bring Tangent to your practice and your community. So thank you.